Well, by 2004, uh, the FBI actually created an MS-13 National Gang Task Force. Right. So they actually started working with law enforcement in El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, and Mexico, and actually had an office in El Salvador to deal with this. Um, by 2008, they set up a, a series of arrests and crackdowns all over the world mm -hmm. uh, that involved like 6,000 police officers in five different countries. Uh, 650 people were taken into custody. So you just started to see these worldwide sweeps that was coordinated. So it, it became a very serious thing. It did. Uh, do you remember this time? I do remember this time. And I remember, let me give you a little, you know, just to talk about a little bit of history of that. I remember when I came out of, of California Youth Authority, YTS, in 1997. I was about 18 or 19 years old. And I was walking around my street in, in Koreatown, my, my old neighborhood. And any given time before I got locked up, you would see five, you know, 10 MS-13 members late at night hanging at a certain blocks. And during this time when I got out, I was all like, damn, we're all, what happened to all my homies? Because there was a turf war between MS-13 and MS-13 in 1996 over a certain uh, street that was, that was drug trafficking. And a lot of people wanted to be in that, and a lot of people didn't want to go ahead and drug traffic and say, you know what, this is our clique, go to your clique. So MS and MS started fighting, there was deaths, there was killings, and some people from MS didn't want to be part of that. So a lot of them moved away, some of them just calmed down, stopped banging, and a lot of them got locked up as well. And I remember the Rampart Crash officers, they would go ahead and pull me over and tell me, damn clever, my nickname if you will, what happened to MS-13? That turf war went ahead and killed you guys. And I was all like, wow, and you will only see a few homies. So as time went on during a, a few years later, then the FBI did wage the war on, um, on gangs. So you need a perfect villain for that. A lot of times the immigrant community are the ones that get that short end of the stick from generations upon generations upon generations. So this villain that they created from the gang was the person that had the MS tattoo. So they started showing the MS-13 person, the tattoos, on the on the TV, just plastering this person's face all over the thing, thinking that this person was living right next to you. When a lot of times, these MS members, these tattoos were people that were in prison in El Salvador that had never even stepped foot in the United um, States. But of course, there was also violent MS-13 members in the United States as, um, as well. So now when... Um, they continued to plaster the crimes of MS. They started putting it in, in a pedestal. Then the National Geographic came out with the world's biggest and most dangerous gang with the face tattoos as well. And kids, they wanted to be from um, a gang. They say, wow, well, we're going to go ahead and join a gang. We want to be from the biggest and what's being portrayed the worst, the, 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 the baddest gang. That's why a lot of times I go ahead and say when I'm asked, is MS-13 the world's biggest and the world and most dangerous gangs? No. And also, you need to go ahead and stop um, promoting or putting it up in a pedestal like that because then you have these kids that do come from broken families that do want to go ahead and giant that end up want to go ahead and do that. But in 2003, also, there was an informant from MS where there was these other uprisings. There was an FBI informant and there was these other uprisings in different um, states in the United States. And there was no connection between them and, and California or El Salvador. It was Central American people that were flocking to other country, um, excuse me, to different states. And not, again, not all of them got into MS, but when these kids did also did feel isolated and didn't have that culture shock how MSS started in the 1980s, um, they started upbringing and say, oh, yeah, so she, they weren't even getting jumped in or nothing. They were just claiming it because they were from El Salvador. So this um, informant from 2003, 2004, he, the FBI played him, paid his plane tickets. They were giving 50 to 60 annual salary to go ahead and see what was going on with these other groups. So what this guy did, he pretty much connected the dots from state to state to state and then con connected the ultimate dot to El Salvador, that line, and that's how that started to get more organized, if you will. Well, by 2011, the task force had made 20,000 arrests. Mm -hmm. uh, by 2012, uh, the U.S. Treasury Department froze all the assets uh, with anything connected with MS-13. And they actually listed MS-13 as a transnational criminal organization, mm -hmm. which took it to, to the next level. And then by 2015, El Salvador had the highest national homicide rate per capita in the world. More people were getting killed in El Salvador, were getting murdered in El Salvador than any place else on earth. Yeah, horrible. 
uh, I mean, that's kind of mind blowing when you think yes. about it. There's yeah, a lot horrific. of countries out there. There's a lot of war torn countries out right. there. There's a lot of gangs all over the planet. Every country has its own gang and so forth. But El Salvador in particular, with MS-13 being the biggest gang in right. El Salvador, right. is contributing to more people getting killed than any place else. When you hear that, how does that make you feel? Well, it's it, it makes me feel it, it's horrific, you know. And given that um, all that stuff, it, it goes back to to the pain of saying, "How do we fix this?" Because I remember even in LA seeing those uh, murders. I mean, there was years in LA where there was uh, three, four, five hundred people a year getting getting killed. You know, a lot of my my own homies and you know enemies as um as well but it goes back to the thing of it it's almost like an everyday thing it's mo- watching it's watching like the movie great uh, uh groundhogs day over and over and over yeah. again and we continue and say the murders the killings the chaos but we don't we need to start talking more and more and put more and more efforts into rehabilitation tactics and giving people opportunities so they won't go ahead and and join a gang but it feels that Sometimes we're, you know, us as a country here in the United States, we want our hand in different things. And we try to f- go fix something that's already broken and we end up shattering it yeah. because of the same continued tactics that we have continued to use in, in, from generations upon generations in, in Latin America, was MS-13, whether it's against MS-13 or just different uprisings that, are, that they feel as a threat or that we feel as a threat from, from overcoming or becoming a communist country, if you will. We're starting to see how is it that we're going to go ahead and fix it. And a lot of it is continue, it's just the same tactics of oppression and oppression. And it's the same tactics that we continue to use in our own country right here in the United States of oppression and oppression when it comes into the situation of how do we go ahead and get that guy out of a gang? Let's go ahead and lock him up. Let's go ahead and throw the key. And when this person goes into prison to try to go ahead and find some form of rehabilitation, there is none. Yeah. There is none, right? So how are you going to go ahead and come out of prison and be a functional member of society, if you will, when we don't, we, we're not focusing on the preventative part. We're just focusing on the punitive, punitive part, if you will. Yeah. 